think we're going to see a new uh, style for man bags or fanny packs <laughs> because the iPhone is telling you you can't safely keep it in your pocket. And I think that that's good advice. And I don't think we have to wait for the CTIA to tell us. This is in all of the new smartphones. And our website includes all of these fine print warnings. So you can find them there. This is what was yesterday's Washington Post. Warning labels on cell phones proposed by the Secretary of Transportation to reduce distracted driving deaths and accidents. And there's, every day there's a new horror story. A surgeon, uh, People Magazine, uh, went off a cliff while tweeting. Died. Um, there are incredible stories of the arrogance of people. Everyone thinks he's above average. Everyone thinks, it'll never happen to me. I'm in control. I know what I'm doing. Well, the short-term impacts of cell phones, we are already seeing legislation in 20 states about this, okay, on distracted driving, which is like driving drunk. But the long-term impacts of cell phones on our health is something that Representative Bolin and growing numbers of people are concerned about. The mayor and town council of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, have declared October Cell Phone Safety Awareness Month. We've got a business campaign for safer cell phones. I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce of Jackson Hole, and many of my colleagues who are members of the chamber are joining in providing free headsets to all their employees who use a cell phone for business. <coughs> Numbers of universities are doing that as well. The campaign for safer cell phones is what I invite you to join. We describe it. Uh, in this book, and the advice is very simple. The world is not dangerous because of those who do harm, but because of those who look at it without doing anything. And now I'm going to read just one final passage from my book. On one of the last mornings I was finishing up the writing of this book, three young men phoned me on a conference call, excited about what they had, meant, had invented. They're not brain scientists, but businessmen. One has a fresh doctorate in applied mathematics, and another is an attorney. One is the first person in his family to go to college. They hail from my hometown region in the Monongahela Valley, western Pennsylvania. I imagine some very proud parents. Well, when I was doing my doctoral research at MIT, I figured out there's got to be a way to reduce the amount of radiation going into the brain and out of the phone by using some secret materials that I can't tell you about, Jeff, the mathematician, informed me. Jeff played football for a major Ivy League school before he got out, before getting badly hurt. He had developed headaches that wouldn't go away with his cell phone until he started to use an earpiece. Could be a coincidence, but he doesn't think so. So he began talking to the others about how to make a better, safer phone. Quote, we figure that it can't be good for you to hold a microwave radio next to your brain. We know that cell phones are revolutionary and that they are here to stay. We are going to make them safer. Our invention will reduce radiation into the head and increase the amount going out. Others are already working on redesigning phones with different antennas. Despite our growing dependency on phones for many functions of our daily lives, it makes no sense to continue assuming that today's phones are safe based on standards that were created for big guys who didn't use them very much when current technologies did not exist. One thing is clear at this point. Cell phones have become as essential to modern life as cars and trucks and jet planes. We spend billions to make vehicles safer for us to drive or fly. We need to do the same thing with cell phones. Rather than parroting assurances of safety based on old science, outmoded theories of physics, and bullied scientists, we need to invest in cell phone safety as we do with other modern technologies. Of course, more research is needed, on that, we are all agreed. But the need for research should not be allowed to become an excuse to carry on as though everything is fine until we have incontrovertible proof that it is not. Yes, we do not have an epidemic of brain tumors in countries that have used cell phones heavily for little more than a decade. But 10 years after cigarettes began to be heavily smoked, we also did not have an epidemic of lung cancer. Years from now, our grandchildren will look back and ask, did we do the right thing and act to protect them, or did we harm them needlessly, irresponsibly, and permanently blinded by the addictive delights of our technological age? I have to say I'm very grateful to Dr. Herberman 
who brought me to Pittsburgh to set up the Center for Environmental Oncology. He is no longer there, nor am I. We are working on Environmental Health Trust because we think we face a potential global public health catastrophe that can be averted by taking simple steps. But the science tells us that there's a problem and we would be foolish to ignore that science. Dr. Herberman is a very distinguished cancer researcher who is now working in immunology and biotech and is here to make a few remarks now to expand on what we have done there at the center and what he's doing now. Thank you. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to say a few words, uh, just essentially to echo what uh, Deborah Davis has so eloquently uh, uh, explained.